Today we're going to look at four dividend stocks, one that's a little bit down on its luck trading near its 52 week low, so it might be a good buying opportunity, two that are pretty rock solid in almost any environment, and a fourth one that might surprise you that's even included on this list. All coming up on Investing Education with me, Mr. B. Welcome to the channel where we help you to learn fast so you can become a confident and successful investor. If that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. All right, let's start looking at some dividend stocks here. And I picked up four that are pretty interesting and I applied a real kind of stringent criteria to them. So the criteria I use is that they, uh, a couple things. One, they must be part of the dividend aristocrats. If you're not familiar with that, dividend aristocrats are dividend companies that uh, meet certain criteria, real tough criteria. One is not so tough. They have to be a part of the S&P 500. So that means they're part of the 500 largest USA-based stocks. So you have to be part of the 500 largest. Where it gets tougher is that they have to have 25 years of not only paying dividends, but actually increasing their dividends each year. Companies can decide to cut their dividend or eliminate their dividend entirely. But over 25 years, these companies not only have paid a dividend and many for many more years than 25, but they keep paying out even more each year. So that's a great sign that they're gonna keep paying it out in the future. And then there's some liquidity things that they're you know, very frequently traded around that too. But the key thing is large companies, large US companies, and they pay out dividends for 25 years plus. So. We got four we're gonna look at. So let's start with one that's been struggling a little bit. And at the end, don't forget, we're gonna look at one that uh, might be a little bit of a surprise. Okay, the first one we're gonna look at here that uh, meets that criteria is Medtronic. You might be familiar with Medtronic that does, um, and here's a list of some of the different categories and the products that they make. They're within um, medical devices, right? So they're not pharmaceutical, they're not drugs. They're more like pacemakers and stents and stuff. And you can see the different categories that they make a lot of different products in. They're probably most famous for their heart and vascular division, but they're very strong in diabetes, pain relief, all sorts of things, urinary tract, a lot of different products that they make and some are really top products in the industry. So let's take a look at Medtronic's uh, financials and see how they're doing and uh, whether they might be a good consideration for you as far as a dividend paying stock, paying dividends over 25 years. So if we look at Medtronic, they're at about 101 right now when I do this recording, and their 52 week range is like 98 to 135, so they're near the bottom of their range. One thing that happened to them is in their uh, diabetes division, the, Federal, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, the regulatory body in the United States that regulates uh, Medtronic, Medtronic and companies like that, uh, had some problems with how they were doing their operational processes. So their stock really took a hit around that, and there's some things they need to tighten up around that to make FDA approval as far as their processes. Nothing that I'm aware of as far as recall or anything like that, more about you know just having their processes in place. So their stock took a hit from that, which may be a good buying opportunity for us. So they're the one that's more towards the low end of their, um, of their price range, where the others are more towards the higher end of their price range. If we look at the dividend, you can see it pays 2.52 uh, dollars per share of stock that you own. That equals out to a 2.48% dividend yield, right? So the dividend yield we want to look at to compare, like if I'm earning 1% on my cash savings account or less, um, just by holding the stock, just by holding Medtronic stock, I'll get paid 2.48%. Plus, I hope that stock price will rise as well, too, is the big idea here of these dividend stocks. When we look at some more statistics around them, uh, you can see they're about 29 in the PE ratio. They're all these companies are going to really have pretty high PE ratios. They're not really uh, value stocks in that measure as far as being really undervalued. They're more like good long-term dividend payers we're looking at here of these four. And as you can see here, the peg ratio about over two, you know, we'd like to see that under one as far as being like a value or bargain under three for like price to book is, is actually not bad. That's actually pretty good for, for getting in that value range for that price to book. In fact, it's price to sales isn't too bad too at 4.8. So that price to book uh, actually is not a bad price compared to what its assets and everything are. So that's an encouraging sign there as well. But you can see if we look at the stock price history over the last year, Medtronic's down about 10% compared to the wider S&P 500 up 26%. So it's certainly been lagging. And not only will it pay us that decent dividend, there might be some upside opportunity is the idea behind that. No, no great shakes as far as you know, any of these other like management effectiveness numbers or anything like that. One thing when we're looking for driven and payouts, we want to look at a current ratio. Are they able to make their current bills? Are they able to pay their liabilities and all that? We'd like the current ratio to be above 1.0. That means you're paying out more. 
you know, you're, not, you're able to pay your bills without, you know, going further in the debt. And actually, this is where Medtronic really shines, too. They're at a 2.91. That's very, very strong. They got $10 billion of cash in the bank, you know, good operating cash flow. So, you know, they're real strong there. So we don't have to worry about them running into a cash crunch or a debt crunch where they might try to cut the dividend. Again, these all are companies that have been paying dividends for more than 25 years. And the last thing they want to do is cut their dividend. And Medtronic is really solid with that. Uh, if we look over here on the right under dividends, you can see they're at that 2.48, you know, it's kind of consistent. Their payout ratio is at 69.7%. And, you know, we want to be looking around 70% or less. You know, even lower is better, but there's companies around 9,900. They can still make their dividends. Again, the last thing they want to do is, you know, cut their dividends. So this is saying that of the net income that they have, they're paying about 70% out in dividends. So the 30, rest of it can go out into uh, other things, R&D, all sorts of different stuff. So Medtronic, a good, historically solid company, paying dividends a long time, but a little bit on the downside, right? So, you know, take that into consideration that maybe there's some value there, especially when we're looking at that price to book. Another company that look at, now let's look at two that are rock solid in the kind of like, um, you know, solid camp as far as companies. And one thing I was kind of looking at with these two was around inflation. You know, we will look at companies that, uh, and all four of them are like this, that have the ability to raise their prices, you know, when their costs of goods become, you know, go up higher too. That's not great for you and I when we're buying goods, but they have the ability to raise their prices. I mean, Medtronic, if you, if you need a heart, you know, valve or something like that, or a pacemaker uh, from Medtronic, you're probably good, willing to pay, you know, quite a bit for it, uh, you know, if it's a little bit more expensive. So another one that falls in this is in the consumer staples category. These are not discretionary, like buying a a car or something like that. This is stuff you need all the time, in addition to like healthcare, you know, things like food, right? And food and other types of services. So if you look at some of that, you know, one of the long time strong players, of course, has always been P&G or Procter and Gamble, right? For, you know, Procter and Gamble. And you, you know, scroll down here, you can see some of the brands and they're in baby care and family care and grooming. You know, Pampers is a big brand for them. I mean, you, you, you probably have used, <laughs> You, maybe in the last week, if not today, some type of um, Procter & Gamble product. So they're real strong in the brand standpoint. So if their costs go up, they can pass some of that cost on because people still need you know, to buy diapers. Here's the, all their stuff in Oral Care Crest and fix it in Oral-B. These are all like toothpaste and other types of dental care, mouthwash, you know, personal care, all sorts of stuff, right? Um, Gillette for razors. Uh, though that's struggled a little bit with them lately with uh, a lot of uh, comp competition there. But strong brand names. So that's what you get with Procter & Gamble. Strong brand names. Um, let's take a look at their results. So I'm going to put in P&G. And this is one that's going to be more towards the top of its 52 range. Right? You know, 161 currently at 159. Why? Because everyone's looking at that. Um, you know, that inflation play and that solid company, something they can rely on, irregardless of what might be happening with COVID-19 or inflation or interest rates, all those things, you know, this is where they, you might hear the term flight to quality. That's where companies like this who have been paying out dividends for well over 25 years where Procter & Gamble comes in. A little lighter on the dividend payout uh, or dividend yield, 2.2%, uh, you know, real high in price to earnings again. You're, you're kind of paying for quality in this company. Uh, again, you know, high price to earnings, a uh, price to earnings growth ratio, relatively high price to sales, a very high price to book, 8.31. You know, again, we'd like that price to book to be around less than three of your value investor, around fives can be a good value, but you know, you're paying for quality here. Uh, and you can see they kind of match the S&P 5 a little bit, about 15% versus 26%, you know, when we're recording this here. And, um, you know, a couple other things that they do well is their return on equity. You know, we look at return on equity, we like to see that number above 14%. They're 29.84. So they've got, you know, a long history of strong management and effectiveness. A lot of revenue coming in. Um, current ratio was interesting when I looked them up before, you know, below 1.0. But again, they're sitting on so much cash, over $10 billion of cash, and great operating cash flow that they can kind of withstand that. I mean, Procter & Gamble, I think they've been paying their dividends for over what, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Something like that. It's real crazy, a real high number. Um, so they're not going to cut their dividend. I, I would be shocked if they ever cut their dividend, at least in our lifetimes. It could happen. I would just be shocked. And one of the reasons for that is if you look at their, you know, their dividend payout ratio, what percentage of their dividends are they paying out? You know, that's only at 60%. So you know, they've got a lot of wiggle room or a lot of room there where they could pay out even, uh, even more. Uh, if they wanted to or be able to, you know, withstand if, if 
they took an earnings, if they took a hit in terms of like revenue, for example. So that's one play as far as something that's really solid, but a little bit more towards the premium price. Another one is their direct competitor, which is, um, which is Kimberly Clark. Uh, you know, Kimberly Clark, same thing. They're all about brands. Uh, they're in 175 different countries, and you can see that they're in all sorts of different types of, of different types of products that they uh, that they're involved in, like Cottonelle uh, bathroom tissue. You know, something I use, for example. So, um, so I, you know, I'm gonna. I don't care if they raise it another 50 cents or a dollar. I'm gonna buy my bathroom tissue, um, and, and I'm buying from Kimberly Clark. But look at their numbers here. Uh, let's take a look. They're at 139. Uh, 143 is the top end of their last year range, so they're near the top again. Very similar to Procter and Gamble with the with the ratios, uh, a little better. This would be the play where if you want a little better on the dividend yield, the 3.27, where Procter and Gamble was at 2.21, so you get an extra percent uh, out of Kimberly Clark. Would be the idea behind Kimberly Clark, but again, I don't even know if that's accurate. That peg ratio of 14, that's really high. Price of sales is actually very reasonable. Uh, at a 2.39 as far as current price of sales. That's a that's a nice, if you look at what you're getting for your sales, that's that's a good price in relation to the sales, not necessarily a good price in relation to their earnings. And if they can make those, you know, those sales turn into more earnings, you know, that would be a good thing, you know, basically. Uh, price of the book, that seems kind of sky high. Uh, I, that might be driven by COVID, right? Everybody trying to buy tissue paper or bathroom tissue, for example. Um, again, nothing so great on the management effectiveness numbers. Um, uh, though, I mean, 316% return on equity, I would want to invest to get that a little bit further. Same thing as far as Procter & Gamble. A lot of companies like this, Coca-Cola is another one, they run below a current ratio below 1.0, you know, and they have, and they might carry more debt, but, uh, you know, this one doesn't have as much cash on hand, good operating cash flow, though. So those are some things to consider. Also, trade the, trail the market, 4.3% up versus 26. So a little bit out of favor in the market. So again, might be for that more that long-term 3.2% income from that dividend play. And their payout ratio is 76%, a little high end, but again, nothing that they couldn't manage. Um, so those are three regular kind of that, um, that uh, dividend aristocrat, 25 years or more of paying a dividends, uh, and are very good in terms of inflation. You need to buy, you know, Harp Pacemakers, Procter & Gamble products, Kimberly Clark products here, they can withstand inflation better than other companies, particularly tech companies. And that's why it might surprise you, the fourth company I think that's interesting from dividends is a tech company. But it's a certain tech company, it's Apple, of course, right? Apple makes Mac, iPad, iPhone, watch, the Apple iStore or Apple Store, all that stuff, um, getting into Apple TV, they, they have so much that they're doing. And again, they're a very, very strong brand name. So I might not need to buy my AirPods but they command such brand loyalty that if people want to spend money on something like AirPods, they're going to buy Apple's AirPods, particularly the people who are very loyal to Apple. And you may not know that there's a few tech companies, Microsoft's another one, but Apple is one as well that pays a dividend. Now they pay a tiny dividend, like a little, ba like a little baby dividend, right? So we're at a dividend here at 0.51%, all right? So nobody's getting rich on 0.51%. What we hope for from Apple is that that price continues to appreciate, that it keeps going up in price. And again, that's near its 52 week range. Uh, it's always good to kind of buy Apple if it dips in price. If they have some announcement or something like that, you know, you can buy on the tip, dip. But that's the idea of Apple is you're buying that, again, for quality and long-term growth in terms of its stock price appreciation. But the fact that you're getting a dividend of a technology company and such a strong brand named strong uh, technology company that's international that is very solid. If we look at some of their stats, I mean, you can just see their price to earnings you know, off, off the roof. Peg ratio, 3.85. Once again, we want that below 1.0. You're paying premium for Apple, whether it's for their sales or their book value. I mean, you're not getting Apple as a value discount thing. This is a growth stock that gives you a little dividend. So that's something to, to look at. If we look at like management effectiveness, you know, we can see that Return on assets, we'd like to see that be above 20%, and that is. So if you're above 20%, that's generally considered an excellent number, and that is 147 return on equity. So their management factors has had a reputation for success, especially from an investor standpoint. You know, they, they focus on other, their employees, the environment, their products, of course, but they also take care of their investors. And they take care of their investors, whether it's share buybacks or buying back their own shares, which helps lift their stock price, paying out a dividend, uh, other types of things, maybe research and development, mergers and acquisitions, things that help us as investors as well too. 
Now, if we look at them, current ratio above 1.0, we're looking for they're barely above 1.0, fine. I don't think Apple's ever gonna have a hard time paying their debts. Uh, if they did, they got $62 billion in cash. I mean, just cash laying around. So, you know, they can make a lot of investments in research and development or buy other companies as we're talking about mergers and acquisitions, so, and pay a dividend. So, if we look at their stats, I, I bet, you, you know, we can see they pay this baby dividend 0.51, but their payout ratio is very high, or very low, excuse me, 15%. No problem whatsoever paying a dividend. Now, they're not a dividend aristocrat. They haven't been paying a dividend for 25 years. So, you know, they don't really qualify as far as that goes. I believe they've been paying since 2012, looking at my notes here. So that's a long time. That's like, um, you know, that's like almost 10 years now, coming up in 10 years. That's not 25, but I think we're pretty solid that Apple is going to pay the dividend. One thing you get with the Apple II is is growing their dividend, right? So I looked up and they, you know, they grow their dividend at about a nine and a half percent rate is over the last five years, they've averaged a nine and a half percent rate growing that dividend. So if you're getting into the small baby dividend, kind of like young know, babies become adults, right? It's kind of the same thing where that dividend can grow over time. So if you're a younger investor and you want to see that dividend grow over time, you know, Apple can be a strong play for you in addition to its uh, stock price going up. So with that said, um, it might be something to consider as far as something that's technology that'll give you a little bit of a dividend too. And with all these things, these are just educational purposes, just some ideas, sharing some of the numbers, things you learn in my courses and all that too, so you can get an idea of um, you know some options out there for you. So those are four stocks you can consider coming up uh, as far as something to invest in. If you find that interesting, check out some of my other videos as well too. Do consider subscribing to the channel. And in the description below, we have all sorts of good links and in, including to the courses. We got some free courses there as well. So with that, I wish you all the best of luck on your investing uh, and particularly if you're investing in maybe dividend stocks.